Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Talk With The Titans, live from London, UK, all the way to the US of A and worldwide. I'm your host, Callum L, and this is Talk With The Titans. Tonight's show, I've got, you know what, this is actually a treat for everybody out there, especially if, you, especially if you're a part of the comedic community. We've got the living legend, the titan of ancient Egyptian philosophy, architecture, archaeology, and cultural history itself, um, my beloved Sabah. Tony Browder. Peace, King. How are you doing? I'm fine, brother. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. I'm, I'm very I'm elated to actually have you onto the show. I think for the very uh, the last week or so, we, or two weeks actually, we've been uh, really puffing up the show, um, letting everybody know that you'll be on. Um, I think for the last uh, several months now, uh, if not even years, we've been holding up, um, you know, this phenomenal piece of uh, work right here, which is the Nile Valley uh, contribution to civilization. And, um, you know, everybody is, you know, literally from the UK, we've got a very broad uh, conscious community. We've got Muslims, Christians, um, you know, Jews, atheists, um, you know, uh, black power. Uh, everybody has come onto the show. Everybody is now, you know, the word Kemet, uh, the word, the words Nile Valley, the words of ancient Egypt, uh, the Medoneta, these types of terminologies are now coming into the, um, you know, the stratosphere of, uh, you know, the broad uh, British public itself. And um, I've definitely been uh, hating up the Nile Valley contribution to civilization. I've been hating up your name, Anthony Browder, as a, a go-to piece uh, to, to start off your journey into the ancient Egyptian uh, philosophy and history. I certainly appreciate that. Uh, you know, Nile Valley is, uh, it will be 25 years old this December. So it's, it's been around for a while and has opened um, a lot of eyes, has opened a lot of doors for me. And there's still so much uh, more information to be talked about, written about. Definitely, definitely. So everybody who's tuned in right now, uh, could I get you to please, please, please hit the share button. Let everybody know we're live right now. It's not too often that we have living legends in our presence. Okay, so we've got the king of Kemet, uh, the godfather of ancient Egypt in, in terms of, you know, for this modern world of getting this information out to you. We've got our beloved Saber, our beloved teacher, master teacher, Anthony Browder on. So please hit the share button. Let everybody know that we're live right now on Titans TV. And uh, let's get it in. Let's get it in. Um, so I know that you, you know, for the last, um, you know, somewhat years, you've been you know, doing the excavations, going out to Egypt, doing field trips. I believe it's you've done over 50 trips to Egypt now? Yeah, you? I'm going back in, you know, in August. August will make my 55th trip to Egypt. Wow, 55th trip. Okay, okay. I need mm -hmm. to catch up. I've got some catching up to do. Um, okay. <laughs> I've got some catching up to do with you. Um, so in your 55th trips um, to Egypt, um, you know, could you, could you give us an insight of the things that you've been actually doing out there? Sure. Well, um, my first trip to Egypt was in 1980, December of 1980. I was fortunate to uh, travel with uh, Dr. Ben on that trip. It was a short, short trip, uh, 13 days. And during that time, I was exposed to information that transformed uh, my life. Uh, I came to understand thoroughly that much of what I had been taught in school about um, Africa in general, about Egypt specifically, was wrong, totally wrong, even though I had attended predominantly black schools all of my life. And that reinforced the fact that a teacher cannot teach what they don't know. So we have been intentionally miseducated. And upon my return from uh, the trip to my first trip to Egypt, I created um, the Institute of Karma Guidance, IKG, as a vehicle that I could use to begin to share my newfound knowledge of, of Kemet with uh, a wider audience here in DC. And it just grew from there. Um, I have been leading study tours to Egypt since 1987. So we're in our, I think, 23rd year of uh, study tours and have been involved in the excavation and restoration of the two 25th Dynasty tombs. Uh, this year is our ninth year of the excavation. Uh, the project is named in honor of Dr. Asa Hilliard. It's called the Asa Restoration Project. And uh, this summer, August the 13th, we will commemorate the 10th anniversary 
of the uh, the passing, the ascension of uh, Baba Asa Hilliard, who uh, died uh, in Cairo, Egypt, at Anwar Sadat Hospital on the uh, 13th of August. So this project is named in his, in his honor, and we plan to have a, um, a very spirited uh, memorial service for Dr. Hilliard at the uh, archaeological site that currently bears his name. So part of my uh, work, uh, or as Dr. Welsing would refer to it, uh, part of my cosmic assignment is to uh, help others become acquainted with the history of Kemet. Uh, to help people understand that it is a indigenous African culture and civilization. And as the title of my book indicates, uh, it has, the, uh, has been the foundation for culture and civilization around the world uh, for thousands of years. And it's my job, it's my responsibility to make sure that that ancient history is presented accurately so that people understand that there's a profound historical, cultural uh, difference between Kemet and Egypt. Uh, there's a very profound uh, chronological difference between Kemet and Egypt. And uh, we have to educate our people to do a better job of knowing our history and then protecting our history, uh, and more importantly, preserving it for the generations that will come behind us. Definitely, definitely. Um, you know what? Because this is just absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I've got to ask you this question here. Um, how did you come to knowledge of self, come to knowledge of, um, you know, the ancient Egyptians, the, the Kemetic history, um, and, and tell us more about, you know, your inspirations, the great teachers and authors, that the lecturers that you've been um, surrounded by uh, for the majority of your life, such as your Dr. John Herrick Clarks, such as right. your um, Dr. Ben, Asa Hilliard, et cetera, et cetera. I know a lot of us, um, you know, younger generations, the, you know, the YouTube generations, so to speak, these names are just simply just going over everybody's heads but they don't realize these are literally the titans and the giants that um you know most of us are actually standing on itself um so could you just give us like a, a, a you know a rundown of, of all that please sure well <clears throat> i can say that my journey to enlightenment began 40 years ago 40 years ago this past february when i had the opportunity to hear uh, dr ivan van sertema who had just published his book uh, they came before Columbus, the African presence in America. And he talked about the fact that uh, ancient Egyptians had built ships, navigated the Nile River, the Mediterranean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, and had interactions with uh, the indigenous people of, of the Americas, the so-called Americas, uh, 2,500 years before the birth of Christopher Columbus. And he said that uh, these ancient Egyptians were black. And that was my first time ever hearing anyone say that the Egyptians were black. It ran counter to every a book that I'd read, every movie that I'd seen about Egypt, every magazine uh, that I had read about Egypt had always depicted the Egyptians as uh, white. And so that began my thirst for the true history of this uh, ancient African civilization. And uh, I think one of the first books that I read was um, John G. Jackson's Introduction to African Civilization, which uh, has an introduction by John Henry Clark. And uh, then I became aware of Dr. Ben, and I was fortunate, as I mentioned previously, in uh, December of 1980, I made my first trip to Egypt with Dr. Ben. And after returning to the States from that trip, I was um, fixated on trying to share as much of this newfound information as I could with others so that they wouldn't be um, misled. And so I started my second company, IKG, as the vehicle for doing that. But one of the most significant moments uh, along that journey was in 1984, when uh, Charles Finch, Van Sertema, and A.C. Hilliard organized the Nile Valley Conference in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, at Morehouse, Morehouse College. And I attended uh, that event and, and met, uh, I met all the great scholars. Um, and was determined that this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to pursue uh, this line of, of uh, research and, and uh, awareness. So um, it took me, let me see, 84, it took me three years to uh, get myself situated. And on May the 30th, 1987, <clears throat> 30 years ago, I sponsored our 
first uh, free of my lecture series. And our first guest was uh, Dr. A.C. Hilliard. So from <clears throat> 1987 until 1992, uh, we have uh, brought to the D.C. area all of our scholars, uh, many of whom are now ancestors, uh, A.C. Hilliard, uh, John Henry Clark, uh, John G. Jackson, uh, Yosef Ben Yelkinen, uh, Ivan Van Sertema, Naeem Akbar, Wade Nobles, of course, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson, Sharshi McIntyre, uh, Amos Wilson, um, Jacob Carruthers, Ted Philobinga, uh, you know, you name it. DC, back in the late 80s and early 90s, DC uh, was probably the hub of the African Senate movement, Malefe Asante. And um, through my company, I had access to the airwaves, I had access to uh, four radio stations, had access to uh, uh, black. Uh, television station had access to uh, four black newspapers. So we were able to advertise our events. We were able to get um, uh, sold out audiences on, on the regular. And as a consequence, we were also able to make sure that all of the uh, presenters got paid. Uh, and they appreciated that because all too often in this line of work, uh, many of the scholars uh, don't get paid. So they, uh, we were able to, to come, we were able to get them uh, access on the radio and television, and we were introducing them to a new audience, and that allowed me to uh, begin to cultivate a personal and a business relationship with all of these scholars, and that has continued uh, to this day for those who are still alive, and because of the work that we're currently doing in Egypt with the um, excavations, as uh, my good colleague, uh, Dr. Charles Finch, has said on numerous occasions, um, our efforts through the Acer Restoration Project is the first time in history that a person of African ancestry has been involved in, in financing and uh, participating in an archaeological excavation in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Finch, who was colleagues with both um, uh, Van Sertema and uh, Sheikh Antijok, as well as Ted Philobinga, uh, Dr. Finch has is, is, is often said that you know, even uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Adijab or, or Tefilo Binga or, or Dr. Ben, none of them have, have, have been involved in archaeological excavations to the extent to which I am. And uh, the only reason I'm doing this is because of my uh, association with them. Uh, I was privy to be introduced to the site by uh, Alina Pistakova, who discovered uh, uh, these sites in 2006, and uh, when I was given a personal tour of the site, I was fortunate to be able to understand what I was seeing uh, because of my relationship with uh, Dr. Clark and Dr. Hilliard and, and others. And uh, an opportunity was presented to me to be involved in um, funding the excavation and, and then bringing groups of people over to actually participate in the excavation. So we are going into our ninth year of this project. And what I have just recently come to understand is recently as September of last year, I've now come to understand that this is in fact what I was born to do. We made uh, uh, a phenomenal discovery last September, which has totally caused me to recalibrate uh, my what I thought I knew about Kemet and its influences on Western culture and civilization, particularly its influences on Western African culture and civilization. So I've got um, a new path that I'm pursuing right now, and uh, hopefully I've got three or four books <laughs> in which I'll be outlining this new path uh, in the coming um, four or five years. Wow. Wow. That's truly inspirational. You know, I've got so many questions I actually do want to ask you, um, you know, but let me just touch on that West Africa um, at present, because I've been getting a lot of, um, you know, comments from, um, uh, you know, people from diverse backgrounds. And they're always, you know, asking, why, why are you guys claiming, you know, Kemet, ancient Egypt? Um, you know, you guys have no connection ancestral wise with um, ancient Egypt. Uh, you know, that being that we are either coming from the from America, either the West Indies or West Africa. So I wanted to know, is there a connection between West Africa and the Kemetic and Kushite uh, civilizations? 
Well, before I answer that question, let me just put that question in context. Nobody questions white folk here in the United States whose ancestry may be from, from the UK, Germany, Spain, Italy, Greece. Nobody questions whether or not they have a legitimate connection. Uh, so the reason why people, uh, and even some of our own people, question our connection to the continent uh, is, is out of ignorance. Uh, most of the uh, comments made like that are comments made out of ignorance because there's no historical foundation uh, to them whatsoever. Uh, but what I was able to discover uh, last September, and I'll share this with you when I'm, when I'm in the UK next week, I will be talking about it in more detail and sharing some actual visuals. But what I uh, discovered last September uh, painted on the ceilings of two 25th Dynasty tombs, not the two tombs that we're currently working on, but two other tombs that we had the occasion to, to visit during a conference that we sponsored last September. I found painted on the ceiling of two tombs, um, a couple, about a hundred uh, Adinkra symbols uh, of the heart-shaped Sankofa sign. So I've been in con uh, conversation with several uh, Ghanaians about that. Uh, and they have been blown away uh, because uh, Ghanaians would tell you that the Adinkra symbols are two to 300 years old. They don't have a clear understanding of, of the origins of those symbols. But within the oral traditions of, 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 of Africans from, from Mali to Senegal to the Gambia to Ghana and, and even Nigeria, uh, within their ancestral traditions, they speak of their ancestors having come to the Niger River Valley from the Nile River Valley. As a matter of fact, there is a book that I'm waiting to get my hands on. Uh, it's being sent to me from Paris, uh, a book entitled um, Pathways from the Nile, written by Bouba Kalam, who's a colleague of uh, the late Sheikh Andijok. And in that book, he documents uh, six migrations of Africans from the Nile Valley into the Niger River Valley. And, and so I believe that we have uh, uncovered uh, the, uh, some hard evidence that will allow us to, to document a uh, migration over a period of uh, probably a thousand years, if not more, of Africans um, taking their cargo of knowledge out of the Nile River Valley into the Niger River Valley where they knew it would be safe. Um, and I believe that they anticipated the, the fall of Kemet and wanted to make sure that certain information did not fall into the hands of the barbarians. Um, and so that knowledge uh, has jump-started uh, specific cultures uh, in West Africa. We do know that the last of the six migrations out of the Nile Valley uh, settled in, in Mali, and it was that culture that gave rise to the Dogon people. Uh, within um, Sheikh Andijok and, and his colleague Te Filobinga uh, wrote and, and spoke often about the, um, the Nile Valley influences, for example, on the Wolof language. Uh, and there were a number of, of similarities in many of the words and some of the concepts. Uh, Van Sertema, in his book, They Came Before Columbus, showed that there were uh, profound similarities between uh, the garments worn by the priests of Kemet and garments worn by indigenous people in the Americas, uh, uh, and as well as instruments that were used uh, by these priests. So we have, um, we have new evidence that we're, we're still processing, uh, but um, within the next five years, uh, that question would be a, a mute question. Uh, we will be able to prove to, to everyone who is willing to receive this profound uh, evidence that um, Africans from the Nile River Valley through Central Africa and West Africa are directly related to those same Africans who were stolen from West Africa and taken to the so-called New World, North America, South America, Central America, and all of the islands in, in the Caribbean. And uh, if we're having a conversation uh, next year, I hope to be able to provide uh, genetic evidence to back up that claim. So we're working on a couple of things right now. And we are, uh, we're, we're changing the game. And uh, I'm, I'm really hoping uh, and praying 
that uh, the generation that will come uh, behind you uh, will pick up this mantle. Uh, there are a lot of young people, when I say young people, I mean specifically young folk in the 20s, 30s, and 40s who are new to all of this. And I'm pleased that many of them are, uh, are interested in this historical information. Uh, many of them, as you mentioned earlier, are of the YouTube generation. YouTube is fine, but there's nothing like holding a book in your hand. There's no, nothing like going to the library and, and doing primary research at the library. Uh, the internet is good for some things, but I know from personal experiences, the internet is very bad for a lot of things as well. And there's a lot of misinformation out here on the internet. And just because someone uh, posts a, a blog or posts a video on the internet, uh, many people who have not cultivated the good sense to know what not to believe, uh, believe everything that they see. And, and that's one of the reasons why we, we're still lagging behind everyone else, because we haven't cultivated a systematic way of determining the value of knowledge that we're going to incorporate into our lives. We have to question everything. Uh, but more importantly, we have to know how to question things. And we have to be less uh, willing to believe something simply because the person that said it made, made us feel good. Uh, we've got to move beyond just emotional knee-jerk reactions to information and, and do the, the hard work uh, that is required in order for us to build something substantial that will uh, withstand uh, at least five to ten generations of inquiry. We've got to do the work. Definitely, definitely. I could think about it. I won't even go there. I won't even go there. <laughs> Thank you. There's a lot Thank of things. You floating Thank around you know yeah i know you know what i'm talking about we don't have to you know we don't have to talk about we don't have to call names but if it doesn't sound right it ain't right <laughs> i'm grateful for that um you know what i have to bring this up okay so in the nile valley uh contribution of civilization um you've got here um study groups uh, and the importance of study groups establishing study groups um and you know what this is what i think is is lacking with inside of our community um a lot of you know the young especially because I'm speaking to my generation, those who are in their 20s, their 30s, and even up to the 40s. Um, you know what? You know, we are hip to this information. We love this knowledge. You know, we're reading the books. We are um, we're watching the videos. We're listening to the audio tapes, et cetera, et cetera. But the only problem is um, we don't actually come together as a community. We don't come together to study. We don't come together as an organization. So I want to know, like, how can we um, establish something in our own uh, cells? Um, you know, whether we're in America, whether we're in DC, whether we're in the UK, uh, France, uh, Sweden, uh, Netherlands, etc. How do we come together? How do we establish, um, you know, a community, an organization to to progress and to actually study sure uh, that's an excellent question uh, but let me let me uh, just build on one of the one of the uh, statements that you made uh, again I want to remind you that now Valley contributions to civilization is 25 years old and so when I wrote that book uh, in 1992 study groups were the rage uh, because that was the means by which uh, people could come together and form community this was before the internet took out took took off and so now with the rise of the internet, there's less people reading. Uh, and, and so there are fewer people coming together uh, to discuss books that they've read. The other uh, thing that has changed so dramatically within the last uh, two and a half decades is the fact that um, there are so many young people, uh, and specifically, I mean, college age young people, folk in their 20s and 30s, who can't read. Uh, who have poor uh, comprehension skills, who don't understand what they've re read. Uh, and that's because of um, the decline of educational systems here in the United States, the dramatic decline of the educational systems in the United States. And that's one of the reasons why, um, why the internet has taken off, because you don't have to read. You watch a video, you listen to an audio tape. And, uh, you know, there, there is something magical, and I'll use that word. Uh, there's something magical that happens when you read a book. Uh, you begin to process that information on multiple levels simultaneously. You don't get that when you watch a video. Uh, you don't get that when you listen to an audio tape. Uh, they are useful ways of conveying information, but they're not as good 
is reading information. They're not as good as holding a book in your hands, uh, underlining, highlighting text, making marginal notes. Uh, and so I'm a strong uh, proponent of, of people reading. Uh, and, and then coming together after they have read books. Uh, but I'm also, uh, 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 so uh, along the same line, I'm a strong proponent of, of uh, literacy. Uh, you have to be literate. And you have to be literate, uh, as, as Dr. Clark told me on numerous occasions, if you want to know African history, you have to start off by reading world history. You have to know about the people who have marginalized Africa in African history. Who are they? How do they think? Uh, and how has their thinking uh, still impacted uh, the world today? So you've got to understand uh, how you got where you are in order to begin to even conceptualize who you are and where it is you want to go. And you have to have people who have done that work coming together in order to formulate a plan of action. If not, you'll be arguing and fighting over silly things that will um, stymie your progress or, or bring it to a halt. So the other important part of your question, brother, is that we also have to understand that it's taken a minimum of 500 years to create the disunity and confusion that we experience within um, the community of African people on the continent and in the, the uh, diaspora. Uh, so our current thinking, our current uh, behavior is unnatural. It is the byproduct of the process of enslavement. It's a byproduct of the mafia. It's a byproduct of apartheid and segregation and Jim Crow. So we have to be clear that uh, our enemy, uh, those people who are responsible for stealing, for selling, for raping uh, our ancestors hundreds of years ago, their descendants um, are living right now and they still carrying on that same mission. So we have to be clear about the, the war against African people. We have to be clear uh, that we are still in that war and that if we are not knowledgeable about our history and our, and our culture and our own traditions, then we will become our own worst enemy because our enemy will use us to fight our own selves. So there's, there, there are many things that any person who wants to be um, engaged in the process of learning who they are as a person of African ancestry has got to be willing to devote the rest of their lives to this process. They have to be patient and understand the circumstances that we find ourselves in, our circumstances were created by people whose names we will never know. Uh, and that in order to pursue this, one has to bring uh, a level of seriousness and that seriousness has to be reflected in everything that you do for as long as you live. This is not something you play with. Uh, it's not something you do to meet, you know, meet brothers or meet sisters. Uh, this is real work. Uh, and if we do our job properly, uh, we will transform the world. And that being the reality, we also have to understand that our enemy, our oppressor, also knows that they have everything to lose when we regain knowledge of self. So they are going to do everything within their power to prevent us from doing that. That's clear. And I don't have to get angry with them for doing that. That's what they have to do to survive. So once you know that, once you know who your enemy is, um, then you'll understand who you must be to not only defeat your enemy, but to also understand that even after you've defeated your enemy, you still have internalized the enemy's perception of time and space, the enemy's perception of God. So all of that has got to be purged from your system in order for us to begin to understand who we really are and then act on that understanding in order to bring into existence a world that will benefit the generations that come behind us. So it's not something that you can just casually do. Uh, and, and those people that are very uh, cavalier with this uh, are not people that I'm interested in talking, talking to. I, I know uh, because of my, you know, 40 years uh, journey down this path, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this ain't for everybody. I'm not interested in talking to everybody. I'm not interested in trying to convert everybody. As a matter of fact, at this point in time in my life, I only want to deal with those people who are serious, who understand what the dynamics are, and are willing to 
uh, invest their time properly such that they don't waste my time. Uh, I'm, I'm, realistically, I'm in the final quarter of my life. Uh, I probably have another 25, 30 good years left in me. And I don't intend to waste that time dealing with foolish Negroes. Uh, I want to work with serious people, specifically serious young people, so that I can pass on to them what I know so that they don't have to start from scratch. And they can leapfrog over me and create a better world for those who are coming behind them. Definitely. I love that. Absolutely love that. Um, you know, just a quick intermission. Um, I just want to give everybody a thank you for uh, hitting the like button and, um, you know, just hitting the like button and actually supporting this great work that we're doing here, uh, supporting um, my Titan, my personal favorite uh, educator, um, you know, the Titan, Anthony Browder himself. Also, um, please hit the share button, hit the share button. And I know a lot of you lot of just only, you know, coming in right now, uh, you've only seen it popped up on your notifications. Uh, just hit the share button, let everybody know that we're live right now on Titans TV. Um, real quickly, I just want to do a quick shout out uh, as well because we've got somebody who has uh, helped uh, to help us push forward this information. Uh, 118 Eel. Um, I want to like to thank you for your contribution uh, for keeping this uh, show going on as well. And also, um, if you lot are new to Talk with the Titans and especially Titans TV, um, you know, hit the subscribe button. We have awesome shows going on. Uh, we do a lot of conscious lectures, discussions, uh, debates, interviews. And we try to do, um, you know, these types of Talk with the Titans interviews and shows at least once a week, um, particularly on a Wednesday. So if you haven't uh, tuned in already and you've missed out, we've had some great uh um, shows literally yesterday we done two shows we done African philosophy uh, 101 um, your afterlife concept from the comedic uh, from the comedic concept uh, understanding the uh, traditional African understanding of uh, Benin uh, we've also went into the Christianity and, and Islam as well and of course we went into different things such as the you know the cosmological arguments uh, we had the, the queen queen of Fuwa on as well uh, Islam, secret history, uh, you know, beginning in Ethiopia. We've, was, we've had so much great shows. So please tune in and uh, have a look at all the shows that we do. And of course, we do a lot of debates at Speaker's Corner, the one place where we go to have uh, freedom of speech and, uh, you know, really critique everybody's ideologies as well. And uh, if you are getting into, um, you know, an African philosophy uh, or comedic history and philosophy, uh, please check out uh, some of the amazing shows that we've done. Um, you know, we've spoken, um, you know, at my saber, my teacher himself has spoken about two great titans that are featured in the African history and philosophy section, such as Renoko Rashidi. Uh, and uh, Dr. Charles or Professor Charles Finch, I believe. Um, so please check out the African History and Philosophy playlist as well if you haven't already. Um, that was the quick break and intermission that I would like to just uh, give to everybody who's tuned in as well. If you've got any questions um, for Anthony Browder as well, uh, please drop them in. Um, I'm actually looking at the comment section. So just literally tag Titans TV and uh, uh, post your question or your comment or your commendations uh, to him. And I'll definitely read it out uh, live on air as well. Um, so let me just get back into this. My apologies. Well, brother, let me, let me, let me just chime in for a second. Um, you mentioned uh, Renoko Rashidi, and um, I, I, I neglected to mention his name. Uh, Renoko was, was a brother that I met uh, through Van Sertema, uh back in 88, I believe. And um, Renoko and I have been, been able to cultivate a, a, a very uh, warm friendship over the decades, um, so much so that last summer, uh, we uh, select group of people who were part of our excavation mission in Egypt, uh, my daughter included, uh, left Egypt at the end of July and connected with Brother Renoko uh, on his first trip to the Sudan. And that trip was phenomenal. It was, it was a memorable trip on multiple levels uh, in that we had an opportunity to visit all of the sacred Kushite sites and be able to make some archaeological and cultural connections between the Kushite tombs that we visit, visited in uh, Sudan and the two Kushite tombs that we're currently excavating. So Renoko is my man. He's my brother. I appreciate him immensely. And, and he is someone who has done 
but uh, I don't know anyone else who has traveled as much as Renoko has. Uh, his goal is to visit every African nation and probably every, every city on the planet. <laughs> and I think within the next 10 years, he'll do that. So uh, big ups to Brother Renoko and the work that he has done to um, uh, highlight our contributions to history and culture. Definitely. Big up to Renoko Ishini. Um, to be honest with you, I was in absolute awe. Um, I had the opportunity to actually, um, you know, escort him back to his hotel. Uh, so I was just there, me and him in the car together, going back. It was about a 45 minute journey. And I was just there, just sitting back. I'm driving, but I'm just like, in awe i'm listening to all of the great stories um mm -hmm. i see terry is just doing something yeah. right now <laughs> He's holding up the fire for, for next friday next yeah. friday i'll be in london uh-huh <laughs> don't worry I'll, I'll, day, 2017 all right we got it all right all right we'll we, we, we'll get into it we'll definitely get into it yeah i was literally um in awe i was listening to all of the stories he had of all of the greats such oh, as yeah. um um, Dr. Ben, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, like, yeah. Great oh, yeah. stories, the personalities uh, that they were. Just It was just, you know, phenomenal. Um, you know, I, it's just a humbling experience just to be around uh, these greats and just soaking up the wisdom that they're simply exuding. Um, so, you know, it's fantastic. So, yes, big up to Renoko Rishidi, indeed. Um, let me see. What's this, Terry? All right, Terry. All right. Yeah, you know what? My papers? What is that? Now, I'm not familiar with that. <laughs> Hold that back up, Terry. What is that? Bring that back up. Uh, put, bring it back some. The Ivan Vester. Is that a book or a DVD? I'm covering the Oh, Renoko Rashidi. Okay, Rashidi. great. I haven't okay. seen that. That's a book. So we 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 don't have that in the states. Okay. Wow. Some exclusives right here. Some exclusives. So again, um, yeah, for real. You're actually going to be down in the UK. Uh, could you let us know exactly when you're coming down to the UK and uh, where you're going to be and how do we get in contact with you? Well, uh, I don't have all that information at my fingertips, but uh, I will be speaking in, in London with Brother uh, Pepper Kai uh, on Friday. And then the following uh, Sunday and Monday, I'll be participating at the African Liberation Day festivities in uh, Birmingham. And um, I've got two different presentations planned. I don't know the times for that, but I would assume that the organizers uh, will be able to give anyone who's interested the particulars on that. They've got some very nice flyers circulating, so they should be able to contact uh, people. Um, uh, there, there are numbers, uh, telephone numbers and email addresses, so anyone should uh, check out the flyers and reach out to the appropriate person. Definitely. Um, Terry, I know that you're here. I know you've got a lot of this information. If you like to hold it up to the screen, uh, so whoever's watching right now, they can literally screenshot the information and, um, you know, rewind this particular video uh, to get the full information. So, of course, uh, Pepper Kai is in uh, North London. So this is next week, Friday. Um, you know, um, uh, the elder is actually going to be doing a presentation called From the Nile uh, to the Niger to the Mississippi. And this is at the Ma'at Center, uh, the Ma'at Center in North London. That is 366A um, High Road, Tottenham, uh, London. And the postcode as well, of course, is N179HT. So I'll repeat, N179HT. This is uh, Friday the 26th of May. Start time is, um, you know what? Let me tell you definitely, the door's opening at um, 6 p.m. Uh, and I'm actually going to tell you that the start time is 6 p.m. Because we know black people are ready, okay? We know black people are ready. So make All sure right. you get there sharpish, um, you know, because, <coughs> you know what? It, 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 uh, the location is, um, is, not, is not big enough for the crowd that is going to be attending. OK, it's definitely not big enough for the crowd that's attending. So I'm definitely letting you know to get there early, um, get there definitely seat. early enough so you can actually get a seat. Number one, uh, you can actually get inside of the building. Number two, because um, I'm sure you don't want to be waiting, standing outside and listen, literally listening to the whispers and echoes of somebody else repeating everything that our brother is actually coming to <laughs> offer and give to you. Um, so, yeah, uh, please get there on time. Um, and of course, the African Liberation Day, this is going to be in Birmingham. Um, I might be there on the Monday, actually. I don't know about the Sunday, but I will try. Um, this is at the St. George's Community. Can you just hold up a bit? St. George's Community Hub, Great Hampton Row, Birmingham, B19 3JG. Um, and this is to do with, uh, what's my brother's name again? I've, uh, 
uh benny what's his name what's his name terry um brother beanie brother beanie brother beanie african liberation day um ald of course um, i know you lot have seen this um he brings down all of the great um authors lecturers activists and speakers uh, i believe last year we had uh irritated genie coming down the year before that we also had umar johnson come down and i believe the year before that was that Tariq nasheed or was that somebody else yeah. I am to read as well. So um, yeah. please make sure you are in the building. Calm down. Uh, get in contact with me. If you haven't already, um, join my Facebook group. Okay, there's Talk with the Titans Facebook group. Uh, we have a lot of discussions going on in there. We've got a lot of promotions going on in there. So I'm definitely going to post up all of the information that you need. Uh, just inbox me if you need the information, and I'll definitely get it to you as well. And don't forget, Black Eye TV is going to be filming yes yes black eyes tv is going to be filming as well so please check out all of the great interviews on black eyes tv as well um okay let's get back into it let's get back into it have we done all the announcements and promos uh because i know you know time is 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 getting at us right about now um again so if you guys out there in youtube land will have any questions that you would like to ask um please jot them down just tag my name titans tv and uh add the question itself um okay so um okay so um i wanted to know because you know what yeah, this was a few years back this was a few years back um i was i was you know i had a a trip to um to luxor i believe it was yes it was luxor i was going to um and i so much wanted to be part of the excavations going on i believe it was ka amun is it the, the tomb of ka amun Karakamun. 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 Yes, right. That's mm -hmm. correct. And I, I, you know, I wanted to get involved. I wanted to be part of the excavation team. So I wanted to know, is there any way that we can fund the excavation uh, going on? And is there any way that we can actually be a part of it as well? Sure. Uh, two great questions. And you can go directly to our website, which is ikg dash info.com ikg-info.com and click on the link for the acer restoration project and what you will find is information on uh, the application process to participate in the excavation uh, this is a legitimate archaeological excavation we work in uh, conjunction with the egyptian government uh, there is uh, a, a wealth of, of paperwork and other things that need to be uh, taken care of every year. So anyone who, um, who wants to work with us at the archaeological site has to submit specific paperwork. And so all of those details are listed on the website. And what we do is we ask that those who are willing to uh, volunteer um, be willing to uh, give us at least two weeks um, <clears throat> because we're the, the season is four months long and uh, we need people who come over who one have the capacity to to do the work and it's not a lot of heavy work it's basically a lot of it is registration uh, data entry some photography and things of that nature you're not going to be doing any heavy lifting uh, we have uh, a team of approximately uh, 70 uh, Egyptians who work for us. So they get paid to do the heavy work, but our volunteers do a lot of the uh, photography, data in entry, registration, and things of that nature. Uh, so all of those details are on the website, all of the requirements for submitting an application. And if any of your listeners or viewers would like to make a contribution to the work, we are a self-funded organization. And, and so uh, details on how you can do that on the website as well. Uh, here in the States, we are a 501c3, which means that we are a tax exempt organization. So anyone from the States who makes a contribution is able to write it off on, on, their, on their taxes. But uh, what we're doing is um, significant work that no other uh, person of African ancestry has done. We've made uh, some phenomenal discoveries over the past um, decade. Uh, our work has been acknowledged by the Egyptian government. As a matter of fact, last September, uh, we uh, formally opened the restored second pillared hall in the tomb of Karakamen. Uh, this event was attended by uh, hundreds of people. Uh, 
Egyptologists from all over uh, Europe, primarily uh, dozens and dozens of, of Egyptians. With present, we had the Minister of Antiquities, the Governor of Luxor, and several other politicians were there, and they all were blown away at the quality of our restoration work. Uh, what I heard from numerous people and had the opportunity to see for myself, nobody uh, on the West Bank of Luxor, I can speak specifically about the West Bank of Luxor because that's where you know, I've been working for the last nine years. Nobody on the West Bank of Luxor has restored a tomb like we have. Uh, we are uh, using actual uh, limestone to rebuild the tomb as opposed to bricks. Uh, we, we, we have, um, we have uh, one of our associates who came to the, to the site on one of our regular st uh, study tours to Egypt, uh, who's an engineer, works in, the, um, works in uh, Houston, and saw what we were doing. We were literally, <laughs> we were literally, literally working at the site like Fred Flintstone with, our, um, with tools, um, doing everything manually because we didn't have the funds to buy the tools that we needed. This brother saw how our workers were struggling to cut uh, huge uh, blocks of limestone by hand. And he gave us the money to buy a, a stone cutting machine. So we have the only stone cutting machine in Upper Egypt. People who have seen what we're doing and have become so awestruck at what we're doing have stepped up and have contributed to the ASA restoration project so that this work can continue. And it's our goal to be uh, finished with the restoration of these tombs within the next um, three to four years, uh, and then to build a visitor center so that we can document uh, this Kushite presence in Egypt and also document um, uh, who, who our, our scholars were uh, Asa Hilliard and John Henry Clark and John Jackson, what the inspiration was for the Asa Restoration Project. So we want to leave a permanent record uh, on the West Bank of, of Luxor, Egypt, to document what, what uh, conscious uh, Africans living in America and the diaspora have done in the first quarter of the 25th, um, 21st century, uh, and leave a record for those who will come to Egypt for the next five, six, seven hundred years. We'll be able to see what we've done right now. Wow, that's just amazing, truly amazing. Um, and I have to ask you this because you know what? You yourself, you found a niche with inside of um, you know, the market, so to say, so to speak. Um, we had all the greats, um, you know, Dr. Benz, etc. Um, you know, giving us this information. We had um uh Sheikh Ante Diop uh going into uh you know the melanin the skin grafting the, the you know the DNA aspect of things and push things forward that much extra and uh you've come in and you've pushed forward with the excavations so I want to know what can we uh do the you know the younger scholars who are now coming up now seeing all of um the elder scholars uh their great works how could what what do you think is is lacking at present um that we can take on uh, as our burden and to push forward and take on that baton to push things, uh, that extra step forward? Well, what, what is needed in the younger generation is a higher degree of seriousness. Um, you, know, you all have access to all of this technology that's relatively new, uh, 20, 25 years at best. All of this technology is new, uh, but technology is, is an asset and a liability. Uh, a lot of the technology has made people lazy. Um, and, and you have to ask the question, what's going to happen uh, if you don't have access to the internet? What's going to happen when you can't use your cell phone? Um, how will you survive? <laughs> uh, and, and so what I really want, want the younger generation to realize is how fortunate they are to have access to this technology. And that probably 93% of the people on this planet don't have it. So don't take these things for granted. Uh, everything that you have is a blessing. And the, the question is now, how are you going to use your blessing to benefit others? It doesn't make any sense if you have these things and you're keeping it to yourself. We have an obligation and a responsibility to reach out and, and, and lift up those behind us, those who don't have what we have. And so what it requires is a higher degree of selflessness. Uh, this is important because we, we are living in the, the selfie generation. And that selfie generation, unfortunately, to me, appears to be more about selfishness than selflessness. 
And I, I can't help but understand that, that this selfie generation mentality is another tool that has been used by our oppressor in order to stifle our development and keep us from coming together and doing the things that we did before the advent of YouTube, before cell phone technologies, right? We interacted with others. We had conversations with people. You know, you go out to, to go out to restaurants or go out on the street and you see groups of people together, young people together, and they're all on their cell phone. No one's communicating with each other. Or if they are talking, they're talking in such a way that is uh, that, that I find very demeaning. So that one of the things that has happened with the advent of this technology is that we we have lost uh, our our interpersonal communication skills, and we've lost um, I think a considerable portion of our humanity and our spirituality. So we have to help uh, the younger generation understand that all of us old heads uh, are not people to be summarily dismissed because we can't do the Twitter thing or because we don't know uh, Google Hangouts. Uh, uh, this is new technology. And if we really are aware of the state of the world and the state of governments in the world, then that awareness will lead you to understand that the state of the world is not going to continue at its current pace. Things are going to change dramatically within the next decade. Global warming is real. Uh, we cannot continue to um, pull oil, suck oil out of the earth and expect the earth not to retaliate. Uh, so we're going to have to begin to reorient ourselves to what it really means to be uh, human, uh, as opposed to just being consumers and, and being caught up on getting the latest gadget, the latest iPhone, the latest pair of sneakers. That means nothing. In the long run, that means nothing. What matters is what you can pass down to the generation that comes behind you, what you're gonna leave for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. That's the only thing that really matters. And so um, I am always encouraging young people uh, to begin to, to understand that 95 to 97% of the thoughts we think are thoughts that are programmed in our consciousness by our enemy. So we don't even know who we are. We don't even know how to think about who we are and how to cultivate the behaviors that will help us become better human beings, better men, better women, people who are able to have more meaningful and lasting relationships with others. That has, has, been, has been pretty much decimated by the last uh, two decades of what some people want to refer to as music, uh, or uh, some people may call it rap music. A lot of it is crap music. And what it does is separate us from our humanity. So if you can't distinguish between, if you don't understand that everything that comes into your body either moves you closer and closer to becoming a healthier person or a, a disenfranchised person, everything that comes into your body, not just what you eat, you are what you eat, but you're also what you drink. You're also what you think about. You're also what you listen to. You're also what you see. You are also who you associate with. So all of these things comprise who you are. And we have to become much more guarded about the things that we put into our bodies. Because on a very basic and fundamental level, don't mean to get too metaphysical on you, but on a very, very basic and fundamental level, everything that comes into your body, whether you see it, hear it, uh, feel it, eat it, drink it, taste it, everything that comes into your body, everything that you internalize uh, affects you on a cellular level. So we cannot afford to just dismiss music. Oh, it's just music. Uh, no. Uh, oh, it, it, it's, just, it's just this, it's just that. Everything has value. Everything either enhances your humanity or jeopardizes your humanity. And so when we can get more of our young people to understand that and express that understanding in how they spend their money, but also how they choose to withhold their money from individuals who uh, marginalize our spirit. When we begin to cultivate that level of awareness, then I can know that we're going to be moving in a positive direction. Wow, indeed. Wow. 
Maheru, true voice, true speech, absolute wisdom right there. Um, now, you know, you, you, you was jumping into the metaphysics, which I love. I've got to ask you this question now. So, you know, if you had one spiritual principle or one spiritual institution that you learned or, or was in, you was impacted by through your studies of ancient Egypt, Kemet, Kush, etc., uh, you know, what would be that one principal institution that you, spiritual institution that you learned that you would love to pass on uh, to our audience tonight? Well, uh, what I have learned from my personal experiences in um, participating in this archaeological excavation for the last nine years, what I know as a result of finding burial chambers. Uh, finding artifacts that probably haven't been touched in 2,000 years, uh, uncovering uh, walls covered with meta nature, and, and finding these priceless artifacts. Uh, what I know is that our ancient ancestors were clear about the fact that there is no death. There is no death. There's only life after life. The body is temporary, but the spirit is eternal, and the spirit is recycled into a new body. And the key is to be able to retain as much knowledge from your previous lifetime when you incarnate in a new body. Those people who do that are people that we classify today as geniuses, like the Stevie Wonders of the world, Sheikh Andrew Jobs of the world. These are old souls that are able to access memory from not only previous incarnations, but also they've been able to tap into ancestral memory. You know, if we, if we understand the, the basic science of cloning, you can take one cell from one body and make another body and make replicas of that body. That is true on a physiological level, but also uh, within every cell, and I'll just confine this conversation to human beings, within every cell of a human being are the memories of everyone along that person's genetic line, ancestral line. So what I feel very confident in acknowledging is the fact that we carry within our DNA the memory of all of our ancestors. And when we create the right mindset, we then become the vessels which those ancestors speak and do their best work. So we are here specifically. The only reason why we are here is to do the work, to continue the work of our ancestors. If we knew that, if we understand that, if we act on that, then we can solve most of our problems within 30 days. <laughs> um, and, and, and so that, this, is, this is something that I have always had a strong inclination for, uh, for at least the last 35, 40 years. Uh, but now I can say, I, I know, I don't believe, I know uh, that there is no death. There is the continuation of life and what the continua, uh, continuation of life requires is that you remember, you activate the, uh, the ASCET principle, you remember. Um, and with that memory, you are now able to uh, create the future. And that's why we are here. We're here to, we are creators. We are here to create a future. Now, whether or not we create heaven or whether or not we create hell is going to be determined by the memories that we access, which is why, as I stated previously, uh, 95 to 97 percent of the thoughts or the memories that most people have are the memories that were implanted in our minds by our enemies. So we don't know our authentic selves, which is why we undermine our efforts, whether we are conscious of it or not. So to know yourself is the most important step that anyone can make uh, along a journey to enlightenment. And the more that you know yourself, the more that you realize that it ain't about you. It ain't about the ego, it's, it's about the, the ego, as, as Dr. Jeffries often says. Uh, so put the ego out the way and realize that we're here to do a job. And we're here to do a job with other people who hopefully understand that they're here to do a job. And if we could do our jobs collectively, then there's no obstacle that we can't overcome. Our, 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 our legacy proves that. There's nothing that we cannot do. So it's simply a matter of, of being courageous enough to invest in yourself and to do the things that we were all sit here on earth to do. Wow, powerful.
powerful absolutely powerful i don't even know what to say after that um <laughs> <laughs> well look well let, let's do this because as, as i mentioned to you earlier my time is tight so we've done almost done an hour so i'll give you 10 more minutes but i've got to wrap up and finish some work so i can leave here wednesday morning and come to the uk without um feeling as though i didn't do everything that i needed to do in order to make sure i had a home to come back to <laughs> at the end of the month <laughs> And also, you know, we was actually speaking prior about, um, you know, post Obama in America, like living oh, yeah. in post Obama <laughs> society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you could just go into more depth of, on that and, you know, how is that actually affecting us, you know, globally as well? And what can right. we do to combat, uh, you know, you know, I would say these potential negative uh, energies and effects that we will soon feel if we're not already feeling them now. Yeah, no question. Well, look, uh, if, if you recall that immediately after Obama was elected in November of, of 2008, people in the media began saying that we were living in a post-racial America. That was a lie. That was a damn lie. Um, on Obama's watch, uh, there were more black males killed by officers than probably any other point in time within the last 40 years. On Obama's watch, there were more women, black women and black children killed by police officers and incarcerated at any point in time in recent memory. Uh, and this was a backlash to the election and re-election of a person of African ancestry, a person of obvious African ancestry. Uh, and, and so as part of that backlash, uh, part of that backlash has contributed to the current election of the most ignorant president in US history. I thought George Bush was ignorant, but this current president uh, that we have is a fool. Uh, and his mental uh, ability is being seriously questioned by professionals and people in the media right now. He is a fool, but he is, he is a, 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 the embodiment of the hatred that America has been living with for over 200 years. And it is a direct knee-jerk reaction to the election and re-election of Barack Hussein Obama. So they're gonna have to live with, with the dumpster. They're gonna have to live with 45. They're gonna have to live with all of the madness, all of the seeds of dissension that he is sowing all over the world. And there's a price to be paid for that. So, um, you know, I'm a person who fervently understands that karma or mod is real, reciprocity is real, and you can't do so evil in the world without that evil coming back to visit you. Um, and, and so we have to be clear about that. And America has reached, America has passed its best days. America is going to experience a continuous decline. Um, and, 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 and so it's important that as America begins to decline, other nations will begin to flex their muscle, which is what we're starting to see with Korea and, and, and China. Uh, so uh, the era of, of white male domination is rapidly coming to an end. And when it does, there's going to be a period of profound uh, chaos and confusion because if nothing else, we know that the European is not just going to give up their power without a fight. And part of their, their mindset uh, that history teaches has taught us is that their mindset is if they can't have it all then nobody can have anything so we need to be very concerned about what they may do within the course of the next um, five years as the balance of power shifts dramatically uh, there will be some profound changes in how the world operates so i, I say that to say that the comments that I made earlier about how the younger generation is going to respond when they don't have access to the internet, hmm? uh, when they don't have access to the cell phones and, and YouTube, how are they going to respond? And I, I, I've been advocating that people begin to prepare themselves for uh, America uh, and, and possibly other parts of, of the so-called civilized world, first world, beginning to look like a second or third world nation when we don't have access to those things that have made our lives so comfortable. We may not always have access to electricity. We may not always have access to clean running water. 
Uh, so we're going to need to begin to revert to uh, some of the uh, thinking and, and, and call on the strength of some of our recent ancestors, you know, our grandparents or great grandparents who struggled and, and, and may do <laughs> without these modern conveniences that uh, I think on one hand are really making our lives uh, much more unbearable. So uh, I don't want to sound like an agent of gloom and doom, but as one of my teachers, Dr. John Henry Clark, often said, is that history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural day, and that all history is a current event. And all we need to do is to look at where society is moving right now and see that this is not new. Society moved in that same pattern 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. And by studying history, we understand what people are going to be most gravely impacted when the shift of power changes. And we can also begin to find out what we can do to ensure that we will not only be able to survive, but to thrive when these changes take place. Uh, changes which most people don't want to think about, but if we're honest, uh, who are we to be spared um, uh, problems that others have had to deal with? Uh, we need to learn from their successes and their failures in order to be able to make a better world for those who will come behind us. Definitely, definitely. And, um, you know, as we're on this topic itself, itself, you know, black people, what are the five must have uh, transformational books that we <laughs> need to get our minds right? Um, you know, full stop. Five, please, five. I know it's difficult, but just five. Yeah, that. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, apologize to the master teachers. Uh, please do not take any offense um, if your book, your book, and your name isn't called out. Um, I could, see, I know, I know, I know. They're in the ancestral realm right now, and they're going to be like, "Hmm." <laughs> well, I, I, I can speak. I can speak of some of my favorite books. Um, favorite books that would be essential for building a new world. I would say uh, Dr. Hilliard Saber, The Reawakening of the African Mind. I would suggest uh, John G. Jackson's book, uh, Man, God, and Civilization. I would suggest, um, I would suggest um, a meaningful book is the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, today is, is his birthday. He would have been 92 years old. Uh, that book is a wonderful example of how a person can transform their consciousness through knowledge. And that's something that each and every one of us can do if we're properly motivated. Uh, two more books. Uh, one of my favorite books, and if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, I think it may have been written by someone in the UK. Um, uh, it's a book by James Allen, As a Man Thinketh. Uh, practical, practical knowledge for transformation of consciousness. Uh, simple, easy to read, but contains very, very profound truths. Um, and lastly, I'll be a little selfish and I'll say uh, maybe another book that folks should have is From the Browder File, my first book. <laughs> it's probably one of the most um, uh, passed around books in prisons right now in the U.S. Uh, I get letters all the time from, from um, brothers and sisters who are reading that book and, and, and write to me and tell me that if they had read that book, uh, five years earlier, they wouldn't be in prison during 25 years to life. Uh, so I know we are where we are because of the absence of knowledge. And From the Browder File has been um, a book that has uh, opened the door for many people. Mm -hmm. And if we do have to jumpstart um, a process, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good um, door opener. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Terry, I'm going to welcome you back in um, for the last minute or so because we want to get, are you there? Yeah, I'm there, I'm there. All right, all right, you're the personality. Uh, you're the personality, man, HKTH, please. I want you to promote, announce um, as much as you possibly can before we reach the end of the show. Uh, all it is, is that I want everyone to make sure that they reach on Thursday, right, for the um, Tony Browder. You know, um, as Papa Kai has been talking, he wants people to come buy the books, spend all your money, 
come out of the place broke, <laughs> but get a form of education. And that will be on the 26th at the Matt Hat Centre, not far from the roundabout, just close to near the Tottenham Police Station. It's going to start at 6. The doors open at 6 o'clock. And then from 7 till 10, the lectures will start. Then you've got the African Liberations in Birmingham. Make sure you reach because it's going to be a fantastic weekend. And it's a bank holiday. So you know that you can bring your family Bring everyone, get a hotel, stay over, enjoy yourself and have your fun, you know? And we will have more other people there that will give the information. We will be having Black Eyes TV filming. So if you want to get information, and then you've got me, Mr. Riggs, the yeah. best man in the planet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you know what? Before we reach the end of the show, you know, I'm going to try to, I, I have to be, you know, I'm going to be selfish. And I'm going to be selfish, not for myself, but for you, my audience members, okay? I apologize. I apologize, Saber, my teacher. Uh, I've got one last question to ask you. And this is coming from Angelo uh, Solomon. Um, and he asks, uh, why is it necessary for African people to learn about Nile Valley civilizations? Real simple. Uh, we, know, <clears throat> we know that humanity began in Africa. Uh, that the first Homo sapiens sapiens lived and lived alone in Africa at least 200,000 years ago. We know that for a fact. We know that the people who are now classified as Caucasian uh, did not come into existence until approximately uh, 8,000 years ago when the African, African genes mutated and became uh, the genes of the people that we now refer to as um, Caucasian or European, which means that people of African ancestry have a 192,000 year head start on the rest of the world. And that we also know that the Nile Valley uh, contains uh, the oldest information, the oldest documented information about culture and civilization. That the Nile Valley is, is, is my understanding, you know, Kemet is significant because uh, Kemet is as far away <laughs> from Central Africa as, 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 as one can get, right? And so one of the reasons why Kemet is played up is because it's closer to Europe. And so Europeans appropriated Kemet, took Kemet out of Africa and put it somewhere in the Middle East, wherever that is. Um, but, but based on my 40 years of study in this subject matter, I'm convinced that the knowledge that flowered in Kemet originated up south, originated in Kush, came out of Ethiopia. And so the, the real truth, the real knowledge that we should be seeking, the real excavations that need to be done, should be done in Ethiopia and in Sudan. That's where the greatest evidence is. Uh, but uh, that's going to require uh, a, a lot of resources. It's going to require generations of people who are willing to dedicate themselves to, to digging into the earth and, and, and pulling out these artifacts and then having the consciousness, the presence of mind to be able to decipher what they found uh, and be able to, to write um, reasonable narratives uh, about this history such that the others will be able to benefit from that. So short answer is Nile Valley is the, is the well, <clears throat> East Africa is the birthplace of humanity and culture and civilization. So if you want to know who you are, start at the beginning. It's there and no place else on this planet that I know of. Fantastic, fantastic. You know what, it's been an absolute honor and privilege uh, to actually have you on this show, to interview you as well. Um, you know what, you've been interviewed by all of the great interviewers uh, in, in the past, uh, you know, on, 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 on the news, on, um, you know, on, on Brock. Uh, Newman show, etc. You know, so it's been a great honor to have you on. You know, one of my own personal childhood heroes. Um, you know, yours was one of the first books I was be there studying uh, with my with my own you know family members and, and community members. We all go through your book, so it's actually an honor to finally um, you know have you on the show face to face, speak with you to pick your mind a little bit and get some insight from you. Uh, so again, thank you very much for coming on Talk with the Titans. Well, uh, it's my pleasure. I look forward to meeting you uh, next week during my visit. 
And, and one last thing before I go, I also want to acknowledge a, a, a very good friend of mine from the UK, Brother Paul Abina, who was responsible for first bringing me out there uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, and I gave him access to my, my directory, and he was able to bring out all of our scholars, Dr. Welsing, Finch, uh, Newton, and others. Uh, he's recently relocated back to, uh, back to the UK, and I look forward to seeing him and some of our other friends I used to hang out with in Manchester, and El in Bristol, and elsewhere. So this, is, this will be something of a, uh, of a reunion for me, a homecoming for me. And I look forward to uh, interacting with everyone and helping to raise some consciousness. And, um, Look forward to making many more visits back to the UK in the near future. Definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, brothers. Um, you all right. take care. Have a good one. I'll see you next week. Definitely. Next week. Next week. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Of course, this has been Talk with the Titans. I have been your host. Um, our Titan today has been uh, Anthony Browder. And, uh, you know, it's been an absolutely phenomenal show. Of course, I've, I, you know, I haven't even read out none of your comments. I apologize. Um, you know, and everybody's here. Thank you for inviting him in on, um, you know, at peace to the, um, to the, the to King, uh, where we got here. Thank you for all you do. I appreciate you, uh, brother Anthony Browder. Um, you know what? So much great, great, um, uh, comments going on in the comment section. Uh, thank you, everybody who's tuned in now. Over 111 people tuned in live right now. I know it's going to be way up, way more afterwards in the next uh, few mm -hmm. minutes to an hour. But thank you, everybody, for tuning in and thank you for being a part of uh, this momentous and iconic and historic uh, moment. Indeed, uh, big up, big up to you all. I can see you. Peace and love, family. Peace and love. We're out. Salute. Peace.